that the Tumham pub, restaurant and cafes will be able to keep more people. And most indoor spare things, including cinemas and gyms, will open. Oh, what's the trees are coming down. Oh, the power lines come down. Okay, that's not a surprise with all the wild weather. Um, just a reminder to everybody to pop yourself on mute. We're going to kick off in a moment as soon as we've let everybody in. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fiona Armstrong. I'm the founder and executive director of Climate and Health Alliance. And I'm really delighted to welcome you all here this morning. Um, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country and their Climate and Health Alliance's recognition and commitment. We recognize Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work and acknowledge that sovereignty of the land that we call Australia has never been ceded. We commit to listening to and learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about how we can better reflect Indigenous ways of being and knowing in our work. So welcome everybody. We're absolutely delighted to welcome you to join us for the launch of our Healthy, Regenerative and Just Framework for a National Strategy on Climate, Health and Wellbeing for Australia. And we're also really delighted to welcome Helen Haynes, the member for INDI, Professor Peter Doherty, and Professor Ying Zhang to join us as well. And thanks so much to the Kaha team in the background who are helping out today. Um, just some housekeeping um, as we begin. I'd ask everybody to put their microphone on mute. Um, introduce yourselves in the chat and share what country you're on, the name of the traditional owners of the land that you're on, if you know. Um, after we've gone through the presentations, we'll have time for Q&A. So when you, um, we'd ask that you put your questions in the chat uh, and indicate which panelist your question is directed to. And please use the chat throughout to comment, um, ask questions and um, share your thoughts. But initially beginning with introducing yourselves, where you're from and what country you're on. I'm going to introduce all our speakers um, before we kick off. And then we will just go through um, each speaker in turn before we get to, um, get to questions. Unfortunately, Professor Peter Doherty has many commitments and he's squeezed us into a busy schedule. He's not able to join us for the whole meeting, um, but he is going to be here to give his presentation and hear some of the other speakers. Uh, you can ask him questions in the chat if it's possible. We'll um, arrange for him to answer them. Otherwise, we might have to take them on notice. So first, we're going to hear from Professor Peter Doherty. He is the Nobel Laureate for Medicine the patron of the Doherty Institute and recipient of the 1996 Nobel Medicine Prize with colleague Rolf Zinkenagel. He's written many papers and is the author of many books, including Pandemics, What Everyone Needs to Know. Um, he's still very active in research, primarily at the Peter Doherty Institute at the University of Melbourne, and most recently focused on COVID-19. Well, um, I will then present on the framework, our solution um, for the problem that we face in relation to climate change and health. We will then hear from Prof um, Associate Professor Ying Zhang, who is a, a senior epidemiologist with over 15 years experience in researching climate change and health. Ying's research aims to build community resilience to changing the changing climate and environment with a focus on the most vulnerable populations in the Asia Pacific. And Ying currently co-chairs the MJA Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change in Australia. The Lancet Countdown being an annual report um, that's a global report that's produced um, by in researchers across the world. And um, I recently described it as the most important annual report in the world. Uh, we'll then hear from Helen Haynes, who is the independent member for the electorate of INDI. Helen has worked as a nurse, a midwife, a health administrator, and medical researcher in Northeast Victoria for more than 32 years. 
She's also the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action. Um, and welcome to you all and thank you so much. I will now hand to Peter, um, who's going to talk to us about the argument for action, why climate change constitutes a public health emergency and what we should expect from our political leaders. Thank you, Fiona. It's a pleasure to be here and it's such distinguished company. Uh, I'm also speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging. The issue with climate change and human health and with health in general, in fact, because we should also consider the health of the wildlife species and animals that in many ways sustain us, is that it goes to almost every aspect of the human condition. As the world warms, as the oceans acidify, we will see massive change. And we've actually experienced some of it through this previous night with massive winds in Melbourne. We can expect much more of that. There are tree limbs down all around where I live. And that's the type of effect as you put more energy into a system, that energy comes out and it can come out in ways that don't necessarily favor us. Now, obviously the first concern, re-health and warming is high ambient temperatures. We know that when we have these terrible bushfires, we often see more deaths in the cities than we do in the rural areas that are burning because of the extreme heat. Uh, heat kills. We are all species, warm-blooded species like us, are designed to live in a particular climate envelope. And if that goes beyond and we don't have those compensatory mechanisms like air conditioning and so forth working, we can be in real trouble. And if you've got extreme heat and water lack, which isn't so much a problem for us in our type of society, but can be a major problem in the poorer countries, that effect is even more lethal. Not only that, the birds and the bats and various species that pollinate our plants and do so much in the environment are extraordinarily heat sensitive. Birds can't sweat. When we get extreme temperatures, we get mass die-offs of birds and bats. Now, my particular area is infectious disease, infection and immunity. From the aspect, from that aspect, what are the threats? Well, obviously, as the world warms, then insect species, which are at the moment may be restricted to the warmer areas of the planet, will move further away from the equator. That will bring with it uh, diseases like malaria um, and dengue, which in Australia, we, we don't have malaria in Australia and we experience dengue sporadically in the north of the country, those diseases will move further south. And in countries where, for instance, they have malaria at the coastline, and I'm thinking particularly of Kenya, that will move up into the cooler regions. So the cool plateau regions in uh, places like that will then become malaria districts. And malaria takes a terrible toll of children uh, in, in our world. Like climate change, uh, we can't have a vaccine made against climate change. We're finding it very difficult to make a good vaccine against malaria. Some of these problems can be solved technically, but some of them, they're very, very difficult, though conceptually they should be possible. The other issue with infection and climate change is flooding, where you have ocean flooding, you can overwhelm aquifers, which provide self, self fresh water, and also river flooding, which we've experienced very much in Australia. We can overwhelm both, we can contaminate our fresh water, and we can overwhelm sewage systems, which will also contaminate fresh water. Again, in our type of society, we are generally able to deal with those types of situations, but in poorer countries, they are much, much more difficult. But climate change goes much more broadly with respect to human health and to human security and sustainability. The issue one thinks about particularly, of course, is food production. That when in the Middle East, we saw the Arab Spring, then we saw the 
incidents of civil war, increasing uh, the, the disruption in Syria, the type of situations we've been looking at over the years. The New York Times novelist, Tom Friedman, looked into this and came to the conclusion that basically what was triggering these extreme events and uprisings was basically lack of food. If you have extreme drought, food becomes very, very expensive and really that will trigger uh, revolutionary movements. We're familiar with that from the French Revolution. Um, the quote that's often uh, comes out of that, of course, is Marie Antoinette, whether she said it or not, when the masses were asking for bread, she said, let them eat cake. Well, that doesn't go over very well, especially in our type of society. So food will become more food becomes more expensive with drought. It becomes life threatening in, for instance, North Africa and the Middle East, where we don't have those reserves of, and resources that we have in a country like Australia. We are enormously fortunate. We live on a land mass that's, that's as big as the continental United States, uh, the lower states. And, uh, and we only have a relatively small population. So our sustainability is not at risk. But this type of issue, that and flooding of low-lying areas, low-lying countries, island states in the Pacific is a major threat to our security. Drought, of course, is, is a major threat and many people are dying already in North African countries. And we see enormous turmoil politically in those countries. And this is part of the equation. The uprising in Syria was again triggered by the fact that the Syrian government would not feed people who could no longer feed themselves because of drought. So what we have with climate change and human health is a very broad spectrum issue. We'll hear from others about sustainable building and sustainable infrastructure and so forth. But this is a threat to us. It's a threat to the species in wildlife and plants and so forth that support us. And it goes to, it, it has the potential to, to trigger extreme events that would threaten our security as a nation. We still have time to act on it. We must act on it and we can't play games and uh, just move numbers around to counter it. Unlike what often comes out of Canberra, saying it is so does not make it so. Actions in this area are translated into numbers, levels of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, temperature rise, acid acidification. Numbers are what matter, not pronouncements and announcements. You're incredible. Thank you so much, Peter, telling it like it is. And so great to have someone like you who can really bring that systems thinking to this issue and, and, and point out the complexity that's involved and, and the urgency as well. Thank you so much. For those who've joined us, um, I'm Fiona Armstrong, the founder and executive director of Climate and Health Alliance. And I'm just going to take you through the framework um, for healthy, regenerative and just. Can you see my screen? I can't, so just give me a moment. <laughs> it's there, Fiona, it looks good. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, so we're very excited to share this framework with you. It was sent with an open Sorry, letter. Fiona. Sorry, just maybe put on the present mode. Oh, and for me, it is present mode. I think you're sharing the wrong screen. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Just I'll stop and try again. Thank you for letting me know. How's that? Still not on present mode. Just give me a minute. It looks the same, just with the notes pages down the side. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, thanks for your patience. So we're really delighted to share the framework with you. Um, we sent this framework with an open letter to the Prime Minister and the Health Minister this week, responding to Tuesday's net zero announcement with a very strong call for climate action this decade to protect health and tackle inequality. 
So the, this framework endorsed by 50 plus um, health and medical organizations to date provides a roadmap for the federal government to implement in cooperation with the states and territories to reduce emissions, tackle inequality and improve health through no regrets policies and initiatives. That means we have nothing to lose from implementing these kinds of policies. I want to acknowledge my colleague Rory Anderson in particular, who's helped to pull this version of the framework together. So I've shared our recognition and commitment. Um, I'll jump ahead to our letter and um, acknowledge all of the organisations who signed on to date, acknowledge that there are many more, some who missed the deadline, and all of those will be recognised as having endorsed the framework and will continue to as we continue to socialise the framework to collect endorsements um, and we expect to, um, to secure in very strong and increasing support. Um, so my email has just popped up in front of my screen. We can't see it. Okay, fine. Um, so I'll, where, where have we come from? The Framework for a National Strategy on Climate Health and Wellbeing uh, was released in 2017 and since then has influenced advocacy internationally, it's influenced state and territory policy and local government policy. In 2020, we led a process um, to imagine possible alternative futures for Australia and came up with a set of, um, of alternative futures scenarios for Australia. Our preferred future um, and the pathway to that we called healthy, regenerative and just. And we brought these two documents together in the framework that I'm sharing with you today. And we're delighted to have Peter Doherty here to, um, to speak with us. And thank you, Peter, for your endorsement of this framework and again, again writing the forward um, as you did for the 2017 version. Um, so just very quickly, this framework is um, organised around eight areas of policy action. Uh, there were seven in the original framework and we added an eight thriving ecosystems to this version of the framework, really recognising and wanting to acknowledge and highlight the fundamental importance of ecosystems to human health and the importance of protecting them. Um, okay, I'm going to just stop sharing for a minute because my um, slides are apparently not on the right ones. Just bear with me. Let's try again. What can you see? Uh, front page, healthy, regenerative, just, and just with the speaker notes down the side. Okay, very frustrating. Same thing again, Fiona. Are we on the perfect. summary now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So really, I mean, just very quickly, um, what the work that we did in the Rewrite the Future process was to demonstrate that a healthy, regenerative and just future is not just possible, it's scientifically, economically, culturally and technological, technologically feasible. We have the solutions available to us right now, um, but we simply must act. Uh, the framework covers the, the health impacts of climate change, which um, you will hear more of from Ying um, and details those in the framework as well. It also highlights those populations that are at greater risk, um, who are already vulnerable and whose, um, whose health will be put further at risk as the climate warms further. The framework is based around um, several key principles, the right to health, community safety and resilience, the notion of planetary boundaries and planetary health, environmental protection as a foundation for health and well-being. I won't go through all of them. Intergenerational and intergenerational equity, however, incredibly important. And in this framework, I think we've brought this version, we've brought the version of Indigenous rights um, much, much more firmly to the fore. 
So the key policy recommendations that sit under the seven, the eight areas of policy action um, are summarised here. Health promoting and emissions reducing policies, supporting healthy and resilient communities, thriving ecosystems, emergency and disaster preparedness, education, community and communication and capacity building, a sustainable and climate resilient healthcare sector, research and data, and leadership, finance and governance, governance being incredibly important. We also point to the international obligations that we have um, in our country, uh, which underpin this framework, including the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and of course, the Paris Agreement, which for those who don't know, actually obliges Australia to consider health in the context of our national climate change response, and which in our current nationally determined contributions, um, we, we don't acknowledge health, and nor does the recent plan announced by the federal government acknowledge human health at all. It acknowledges soil health, but not human health. Um, other important covenants, the Sustainable Development Goals, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So you can read the full framework at this link here. Um, and I just want to acknowledge those organisations that have signed up to support the framework already. Um, we're delighted to have the, the, their support. I want to emphasise that this framework offers strategies for comprehensive um, climate risk management. It's not just a framework for the health sector. It offers a pathway to responding to climate change in ways that also protect health and well-being and address historical injustices through the implementation of reforms outlined in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It calls for very strong 2030 targets for climate financing and for children and young people to have a seat at the table on climate decisions. So where the intention of the framework is to provide a roadmap that can be progressed into a formalised strategy and implemented by the federal government in cooperation with the states and territories. But it is a framework for everyone. And there are recommendations here for many different stakeholders to action. So I'll stop there and hand over to Ying. Thank you, Ying. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully it works. Looks good. Yeah, thanks, Ying. Oh, uh, great. Um, I'm speaking today from uh, Camarago land in Sydney and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. And first, first of all, congratulations to Kaha on leading another milestone project to release the second version of a national framework for climate, health and well-being for Australia. I'm so pleased and honoured that I can be part of the moment today. Um, I am the co-chair of the Australian Countdown on Health and Climate Change. The team was established in late 2017 with about 20 experts from nine institutes, institutes aiming to develop and track indicators of the national progress on health and climate change. I saw Professor uh, Tony Kipon is um, in the audience here today as the key driver of the initiative. Um, and I'd like to highlight my key message today on the very first slide. Um, the persistent lack of a national health and climate change strategy continues to put Australians' lives at risk. And scientific findings support uh, the framework and urge government policymakers to adopt it urgently. So the team published the first report in 2018 and concluded that Australian um, policy in action threats lives. Um, based on analysis of over 40 indicators. In 2019 report, we saw mixed progress on health and climate change in the year of the federal election. Um, last year, uh, we focused on bushfire related indicators and highlighted the lessons learned from the unprecedented bushfire in the, um, from the black summer. And this year's full report was just released last week uh, one of you may have attended our launch event uh, last Thursday, where we shared some key findings and the implications uh, for Australian community. I will probably share some of the key research findings again 
to demonstrate why we need a national strategy to address health and climate change in Australia. And this year's report, we updated 37 indicators in the five sections, including the impacts and vulnerability, adaptation and mitigation, and the um, economic and the political context. We largely fo followed the methodological framework of the Lancet countdown, but used the Australian database and context in our analysis. Oops. What's happening there with the pencil? <laughs> um, anyway, um, now I will show some of the scientific findings from several indicators of this year's report. Um, this is a, a new indicator shows that um, heat not only increases mortality and hospital admissions, but also impacts our daily lives in terms of reduced opportunities to be involved in sports and exercise. And the number of days that these activities would have been suspended due to extreme heat risks more than doubled in 2019 compared with the five year average between 2001 and 2005. And this may have long term impacts on our health given the health risks of physical inactivity. Um, in reviewing Australia's adaptation plan for health, and this is what we wrote in this year's report, um, there remains no national climate change adaptation plan for Australia's health. And the framework for a national strategy on climate health and well-being for Australia produced by CAHA sets out a recommended approach that has not yet been adopted by the federal government, unfortunately. Um, and uh, the Australian government's mitigation strategy is also lagging behind other developed countries in many ways. And this indicator shows that Australia's healthcare system accounts for about uh, 6% 6, 6 of the country's greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see an increasing tra trend in the picture. And so that, there are lots of work to do towards a more sustainable uh, healthcare sector. Uh, as you know that our Prime Minister has finally set a carbon emission target, which uh, is a positive step, but inadequate and to protect Australia's health from climate change. And this indicator shows that the annual cost from heat-related mortality for Australia is estimated to be around $6.8 billion over the last two decades. And the impact on the economy and the whole society is enormous through the impacts of climate change on our health. But the point is that the, the health impacts from heat are largely preventable. And scientists have already provided solutions to reduce the health, heat health risks with some uh, cost-effective interventions. We just need to act. And our team also develops um, policy briefs to uh, accompany the scientific reports. And the policy briefs were uh, developed based on uh, not only the scientific findings, uh, but also consultations with individual experts and stakeholders on health and climate change in the country. Uh, in previous policy briefs, we, uh, we've strongly argued for a national strategy on health, well-being and climate change, which does require authentic leadership in the federal government. And this year we provide some uh, uh, specific recommendations on heat and health strategy, um, empowering um, how we can empower the, the first peoples and uh, achieve sustainable healthcare for Australia. And these policy recommendations align with the national framework that um, is released today. And that's what we are talking about today. Um, but finally, I'd like to give special thanks to these organizations that um, fully um, support the MJ Lansing Countdown work and use the research findings in their advocacy efforts to call for uh, more climate actions. Uh, we need solidarity and to work together to achieve our uh, shared vision as we are responding to the pandemic. Uh, we welcome more partnerships 
as health communities are increasingly recognizing climate change as a health emergency. So together we can drive the changes required to protect people, uh, Australia's health from climate change. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ying. And I just want to um, acknowledge the incredible leadership uh, from you and other climate and health researchers in Australia. We're incredibly fortunate to have dedicated, skilled um, researchers throwing themselves at this challenge and, and producing excellent guidance uh, to document the issue and, and the solutions. So I'm delighted now to welcome um, Dr. Helen Haynes, who can talk about the importance of political leadership on this challenge. Thank you so much, Fiona. And um, I want to acknowledge the, the uh, panel that I sit with today, Professor Doherty and Professor Zhang. And to acknowledge uh, Professor Tony Capon, lovely to see you again, Tony. Um, Tony was one of the first people I met in this space when I came to Parliament. I'm coming to you today from Bangaran country in northeast Victoria from my home, a small farm here in Wangaratta, and I'm really delighted to join with you. Here in northeast Victoria, uh, we understand the impacts of climate change extremely well. Uh, it's no surprise in many ways that this electorate has uh, been at, uh, well, uh, at the forefront of community action to change political leadership because what we were experiencing, what we are experiencing, is the impacts of uh, a lack of strong policy in climate action. When I ran for the seat of Indi, uh, following my fantastic predecessor, Cathy McGowan, Many people said to me, Helen, you won't win Indi if you keep talking so powerfully about why we need on climate, why we need to act on climate change. Uh, and I said, well, too bad. Um, we need political leadership around climate change. And uh, here I sit as the member for Indi. So I think we, we showed here that you can, in a rural seat, talk strongly, scientifically, calling for better action on climate change and get a seat in the House of Representatives. So just, of course, during the Black Summer fires, bushfires heavily affected the region that I represent. Heavy smoke caused respiratory illnesses uh, and uh, our emergency departments had, uh, had uh, their staff under enormous pressure as they tried to manage um, what were large numbers of evacuees from the bushfires here in northeast Victoria. And what I continue to see and advocate for is the longer term mental health impacts across the communities that were, were deeply affected. And I've spent many, many hours uh, working with the health services in Corriong, particularly in the Upper Murray. I'm very pleased that I've been able to get ongoing mental health support funding for them. Um, but it shouldn't have taken such terrible bushfires for that to happen. Uh, as Fiona said, uh, my background is in health. I, I'm a nurse and a midwife, and uh, I undertook a PhD in medical science and had worked for 12 years in rural health research prior to coming to Parliament. One of the things that I knew uh, from my work in rural health was the impacts of fear on people and their health, fear uh, about a changing climate, uh, what I undertook with medical students were file audits around uh, the impacts of heat stress and uh, uh, the impacts on admissions to our hospital when our temperatures got into the extreme zone. And what I've, of course, seen after so many years of uh, working in healthcare is the impact of the social determinants of health and the change when we have extreme heat days, the impact that has on uh, our people who don't have air conditioning or who live in, in uh, conditions that uh, simply can't cope with really, really hot days. I've also seen, of course, the impacts of poverty where people don't have uh, access to the internet uh, and have very poor um, mobile phone connection. And that's, uh, that's an appalling situation in rural Australia where the connectivity still remains very bad in many places. Um, but I'm here to tell you not to lose hope uh, with political leadership. Uh, yes, it's extremely frustrating. Yes, we are lagging behind the rest of the world. Uh, yes, I've just returned from the parliament last night after an extremely frustrating couple of weeks uh, where we saw um, this uh, odd negotiation going on within the coalition. And I've had uh, plenty to say about how disappointing uh, the results of those negotiations are in terms of 
of what plan has been put forward for rural and regional Australia. But I say not to lose hope because uh, certainly what's been going on on the crossbench is uh, we have representation on the crossbench now that's been actively working for policy solutions uh, to get us out of this gridlock in Australia. I'm very proud to be a co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action. I was very proud uh, to be the seconder on Zali Stegall's climate bill. Uh, and again, it's, um, it's a powerful sign to the nation where a rural and regional Australian MP stands up alongside an inner Sydney MP and, and eliminates this silly, silly uh, um, divide that gets talked about between rural and urban Australians. Uh, it's just a foolish conversation that doesn't lead us to a solution. I've been very proud to stand with my community and undertake policy co-design to bring forward what we've called uh, the local power plan, which is about uh, very strong uh, policy solutions to ensure that everyday rural Australians truly benefit from what is an inevitable boom in the renewable energy space. I want to see across rural and regional Australia uh, similar policies to what we what we see in uh, in places like Germany, where 10% of all renewable energy projects are owned by farmers. And it was a very proud day for me to introduce legislation into the parliament, which would see uh, if the government would only only listen um, the opportunity for rural and regional Australia to truly benefit and to see. Um, solar panels, batteries uh, in every small town where uh, energy security is a real threat uh, to make sure that when the next bush fire comes through that the lights don't go out at the local hospital. Uh, policies that would really bring uh, regional Australia along with, um, with real climate action. And there were many, many members of my community who helped co-design that policy in the parliament with me that day. Um, I just, uh, just listened to, uh, of course, to Ying's incredible work. And uh, for me, the Lancet series is the work that I go to so often. And for me, it's, it's the powerful documents up there with the IPCC reports. Just this week, um, I met with the Deputy Prime Minister, I met with the Prime Minister and I met with the Treasurer to talk about how they can do so much better on climate and to encourage them that no matter what seems to be going on uh, in the Cabinet with, uh, with the National Party, that there are other policies on the table that they could bring forward with confidence. Make no mistake that the government was forced to act on this uh, net zero by 2050 target. And I really welcome it. Um, they were forced to act because of looming threats to losing their seats in inner city, um, cities of Sydney and Melbourne. And that threat is coming from uh, climate focused uh, independence and climate focused independents who also strongly believe that we can do better with our integrity in parliament. Uh, I really encourage you uh, to continue your leadership. Uh, it, it, there's people like me and many others like me who are putting up their hands to run for parliament because of the work that you do. Make no mistake, we are listening and we just need more of us, really, we need more of us on the crossbench. I believe that we can do that. I really believe that uh, with strong voices in the parliament and threats to the status quo of long held uh, what's been known as safe seats that we actually can make a difference. And I think here in Indi, um, we've demonstrated that uh, the seat of Indi was held, held by uh, the conservative members for really since federation until the community said, we are no longer going to be cynical. We're no longer going to sit on our hands. We're actually going to turn up and try and change things. So the work that you're doing inspires people like me, it inspires communities such as mine. And I think that we are on the cusp of change at this next election. And uh, I encourage you to keep doing the work, bringing it forward. Uh, it gives me the evidence that I need when I bring a motion to the house on climate and health. Uh, likewise, the farming, um, farming groups gave me the evidence that I needed to bring forward a motion to the house on climate and agriculture. And it gives my colleagues uh, the evidence and the courage that they need to create the policies that we try to get debated in the House. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, I know that. I also wanna just add that, uh, Fiona, you mentioned uh, in the incredibly powerful framework report that you've put forward about the voices of young people. And uh, just in the parliament, 
last week I gave a speech that was written by the young people of India. It was all about climate change. And I've brought those young people together. They now have a, an advisory panel to me as the member for Indi. They work with me on this. So our young people, uh, oh, we need to listen to them and we need to give them courage and hope as well. And that's what you're doing with the work that you do. So thank you. Thank you, Helen. And thank you for your incredible leadership and the inspiring example that is Indi for having the courage to showcase this model to demonstrate how effective it is and to give hope to other people um, around the country that a, a better form of democracy and better representation in parliament is possible. Um, we're very pleased to have a friend like you um, in the parliament. Um, so thank you all. We've heard from Professor Peter Doherty about the global picture and why the current announcements from the federal government and plans are incompatible with the challenge that we face. We at Climate and Health Alliance have presented our pathway of solutions um, and we've heard from Ying about what the science tells us. So we want to hear from you. Um, what, what questions do you have? I can see that some are beginning to um, land in the chat. So thank you so much for that. I might begin a question from myself to Helen about, you know, this comprehensive framework. Um, as I said in the beginning, the earlier version of the framework has been very effective in um, in somewhat to our surprise, I confess, uh, influencing policy at the state and territory level. What we found is that when um, people are, you know, rummaging around in the garbage can of policy ideas, um, that, you know, this is what they find and um, and that elevates the opportunity to um, to move these ideas into, um, in, into practice. And so it's influenced, you know, for example, the Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Adaptation Plan in Queensland, um, policy development on the topic in Tasmania, um, informed the WA Health Inquiry, um, informed some of the work that's happened in the, in the great leadership in um, Victoria. So what's your advice, Helen, about how we as a community can help bring this forward. We're hearing from the scientists that we need this framework. Uh, the health sector has come together to produce a very comprehensive roadmap. Um, what would be your advice for helping it to get traction? Look, um, Fiona, I think what you've just described is that you are getting traction and you're getting traction at the state level. And the reality, of course, is that um, helps health service delivery comes from um, state governments more, more so than, than federal governments. So while we may have uh, considerable frustration at a federal level, we are, uh, we are making good progress at state and ter territory level. So um, don't lose sight of the incredible um, importance of that. I think what I would like to see, and um, uh, we, you know, I certainly amongst many others had a lot of hope for a national cabinet. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't hasn't um, played out the way that many of us hoped it might. But when you have uh, state and territory governments around the nation coming together, and whether it's the old um, old system or whether it is now national cabinet, and putting forward the results and the impact that policies such as yours have had in in um, their states, uh, I think that that surely must uh, impact on the federal health minister and the federal health department. So um, keep going with that. And it, it's also, again, I, um, I, I put to you that uh, if we can actually change the status quo in the federal parliament, and right now, let's not forget, there's actually 75-75 uh, on either side of the aisle with the speaker having the casting vote, um, that people such as me could then put forward legislation which has a very real chance of being um, voted through the parliament. So um, we may only be one electoral cycle away from having greater impact in the federal parliament, but keep up the work at the state level. I think that's really powerful. Wonderful, thank you very much, Helen. Um, I've got a question for Ying. Is there any possibility of having healthcare consumers involved in translating your research to their communities? Um, yes, great question. Um, the, there are always opportunities for us to uh, engage more stakeholders and um, we are developing this um, MJ Lansing countdown with more partnerships to get in touch if you have some ideas or suggestions to us. And thank you. Thank you. 
Um, another question for you, Helen. Um, is there a place for participatory budgeting and co-production in communities in a federal level? I suspect that you're already doing this. Yes, I am already doing this. Um, every uh, uh, every few months I meet with the nine local governments of my electorate. We talk about many issues. We talk about how we might work together. And prior to the federal budgets, we collaborate and put forward a budget submission. And I then call for other community groups and organisations to join on that budget submission as well. And you know, this participation in putting forward positive solutions into the federal budget is really powerful. Um, just recently, most recent example, right now on the border, we have a very big outbreak of COVID. It's the first time we've seen COVID in our rural area since the pandemic began. Uh, we're trying to care for almost 500 people now in the community. Uh, our rural health services are stretched to the limit. We can't keep up with testing. We have no negative pressure rooms in the Albury Wodonga uh, Hospital, which is extraordinary. It's the biggest health service we have. Um, there was. Uh, a journalist rang me and said, oh, I, I, I believe there's no negative pressure rooms. I said, that's right. And uh, here's our budget submission from the last two budgets where we called for that. We had it in black and white. I took it again to the treasurer yesterday when I was describing the problem on the border and, and said to him, treasurer, we asked for this money twice. Uh, and now we're in the situation where we have to admit people into our cancer hospital. Um, that was a very powerful meeting with him and that uh, call for those funding for those rooms would not have been there had my community not participated with me in making clear what the needs were in the community. So really, really, really important needs identified by the health professionals who otherwise may not have had any chance to put any, um, any bids through to a federal budget. Thank you very much. Um, while I'm waiting for another question to arrive in the chat, I might just share with people who may not be aware of the incredible leadership that's happening in the international health and medical community, um, in part driven by the Global Climate and Health Alliance. But this work is really very mainstream now um, among the health, health and medical community across the world. Uh, there's a lot of us working together to bring this issue to the COP. Um, there's been a healthy climate prescription letter which has been sent to the leaders of all nation states um, on behalf of health and medical um, professionals and groups around the world that the signatories to that letter representing 450 million health professionals around the world. So, um, you know, there's a lot of energy going forward, to, um, going to bring this issue forward. The World Health Organization has been demonstrating a lot of leadership on this issue for over a decade now. They have guidance for um, health institutions on how to reduce their carbon footprint. They've produced another report that would um, ahead of the global climate talks in Glasgow. There will be a global climate and health summit at Glasgow. And under the UK government's leadership, this, this COP, the Conference of the Parties, is being called the Health COP. Um, because it's prioritising health in a way uh, that hasn't happened before. The UK government has developed what they're calling the COP26 Health Initiative, and they are inviting governments from around the world to make commitments under two, two pathways uh, to protect and promote health and wellbeing. And those are to develop climate resilience and adaptation plans, and also to commit to low carbon and sustainable health care. So we worked with the UK government and the World Health Organization and our international partner, Healthcare Without Harm, uh, last month to hold a round table for Australian governments to introduce uh, those commitment pathways to them and to invite them to make commitments. Um, and I think in the midst of um, the global pandemic, um, we had several states in lockdown at the time, but we had seven of the eight states and territories attend that meeting. And I think that that demonstrates the level of priority that has been given to this issue at the state and territory level. So echoing um, Helen's point about the fact that the states and territories are leading. Um, and if any of you have seen the recent Climate Works report, you'll see that the states and territory policies together demonstrate a much more ambitious pathway to net zero than the federal government's action. So there is a lot of reason for hope. There's a lot of leadership from 
this community, uh, which is very inspiring. And, um, and here at home, for example, the medical colleges um, working together to produce a climate a report on climate change and health and to use that to inform their advocacy. So um, yeah, lots of, lots of reasons for hope. Now I'm just gonna go back to the chat uh, and grab another question. Um, for Helen, uh, when governments are putting together policies, how much do they look towards external organisations such as CAHA to help guide their policies? Or do they just create policies within their own ranks? I've got a view on that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, look, um, yes, uh, of course, the, the, policy, the policy frameworks and ideas come through uh, from departments um, uh, before they land on the, the minister's desk. And um, as part of the workup of any particular policy or legislation, there is, of course, um, stakeholder engagement and, uh, and widespread investigation of what what solutions uh, are available. Now, um, there's no doubt in my mind that the work that you do is, is the kind of work, it's the kind of evidence that should be informing a departmental brief that then goes to the minister. Um, I guess we haven't seen change in the way we want to see it. So the impact of, of the work that you're doing in terms of changing policy then comes into the the political realm and it also comes into and I'm, and I'm going to say this because there's a lot of discussion right now as we're coming into an election um, the question to ask is who else is influencing policy um, is policy being formed from the best ways uh, the best ways forward is it being formed from a, an evidence base is it being formed from a real needs analysis um, or are there other influences? And I am very concerned, as are many other, other people, that there is a, a undue influence coming from various other lobby groups and political donations. It's why I put a bill to Parliament just last week to, um, to limit the amount of uh, political donations to, uh, to make sure that there's transparency around that and that we can truly see who is influencing decision makers. I, I think, again, it's why integrity in politics is synergistic with real evidence-based change on climate policy. So yes, your work absolutely informs the process, but the question to ask is uh, what other influences are there? Okay, thank you very much. And Helen, again, you mentioned Zali Stegel as someone uh, demonstrating a lot of leadership in the parliament. And um, I want to also commend Zali on her work and to point the fact that we have supported the climate change bill. Uh, there, are, there are many, I suspect, in this room um, and on this call who are deeply concerned about what they would consider to be a climate health emergency. Um, so a question from Jackie, um, who is concerned that Zali's bill does not go far enough on emissions targets with a net zero by 2050 target, um, do you think it should be stronger? Thanks, Jackie. Look, a yeah, really important question. A um, couple of things with Zali's bill. There is uh, also a target of up uh, of close to 60 per cent for 2030, um, which is certainly way above what the government are proposing with their, um, well, they haven't actually changed really their, um, their target by 2030, but we know it's probably going to hit around um, 30% based on uh, the accounting measures that they undertook to get there. Um, I'm sounding very political, I'm sorry. I literally got home uh, at midnight last night from Parliament. <laughs> um, look, there is also room, of course, within Zali's bill to make amendments to make those targets stronger if people think they should be. The problem is that um, we have this situation at the moment where the government will not allow the Parliament to debate Zali's bill. So that's the kind of work that Parliament should be doing is actually looking at a piece of legislation and saying, well, look, look this is good, but we could make it better or uh, we need to change this part or that part. So there's room to do that, Jackie. Um, uh, again, uh, also, if Zali's bill was ever to be passed, uh, the work of the Commission um, uh, has built in periods of review. So, it, you know, again, targets can be uh, not only legislated, but reviewed. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, we're going to have to wrap up in a moment, but I want to give Ying another opportunity to make a few comments. There's lots of questions flying in for Helen. 
And uh, I think, um, you know, there's a, a great weight of all of our hopes on Helen as someone in the parliament. We thank you again um, for your leadership, but our, our scientists who are doing the work to um, bring the evidence forward and to underpin the, the research translation work that we do um, to guide policy is incredibly important. So I just want to give Ying an, an opportunity before we wrap up to talk a little bit about that work at the global level um, and any examples that you might be able to point to where where that science has been translated into policy? Um, um, I have to admit there are uh, lots of frustrations uh, as a scientist in um, climate and health research, um, but we see more and more uh, engagement with um, different stakeholders, uh, in, um, especially in recent years. And I, I just want to highlight um, one probably final comment here. Um, climate change is um, not uh, uh, all about uh, doom and gloom. Um, climate change is also the uh, greatest global health opportunities as recognized by the Lancet um, Countdown Project. Uh, I also want to um, call for collaborations among different sectors to, um, uh, to make progress and changes we need. And as Professor Melissa uh, Hoswell mentioned last week at our uh, launch event, we would love to see more positive messages in the headings of our report. And um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, as in Ying, and um, and thank you, Helen, and and thanks in absentia to Peter Doherty, who is kind enough to join us and share his um, inspiring words of wisdom, as always, but had to dash off. And thank you all so much for joining us for this meeting this morning. Um, the launch of our framework um, is, of course, just the beginning of this uh, edition and this new stage. So we look forward to working with our member organisations, the individual members of CAHA, um, our uh, other allies and partners to bring this framework forward to parliamentarians and decision makers. And we'll continue to work to socialise it um, with different stakeholders. So if any of you want to organise an event or provide a forum um, to promote this framework, please let us know. Um, I just want to finish with by going back to a point that um, Helen made about bringing children's voices forward and, um, and to um, echo that and to say we do need to, as a community, um, as, a, as an ageing society, actually, step back and, um, and give our children and young people opportunities to lead. The people who are inheriting this country and its future need to have a greater say in, um, in, in the future that they choose. Um, and the same goes for our Indigenous people. We need to um, step back and allow our First Peoples to step up. There's a lot that can be learned from um, in 60,000 years of inhabiting this country and um, showcasing um, what that, you know, Indigenous ways of being and knowing can tell us about how we live in a climate change country. And that doesn't come from pointing to them as vulnerable. Um, communities. It comes to highlighting their strengths and stepping aside and allowing them to assume leadership and control over the decisions that affect them and their communities um, and all of us. So thank you all again for joining us. It's been a pleasure to share this work with you. Of course, those of you who are on our mailing list, and um, you, you will all be, if you've um, now registered for this event, you'll be hearing more from us, and I encourage you to continue to support and pro promote this work where you can. If you're not already a member of Climate and Health Alliance, you might consider joining. Um, Thank you to my team who've been um, working in the background. Uh, we have an incredible and very small team here at CAHA. Uh, they work incredibly hard on, on your collective behalf. So thank you to the CAHA team for everything that you do. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Ying. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, Ying. Bye, yeah. everyone.